Good Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin with breaking news at this hour. Russian forces are closing in on the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. U.S. defense officials say the Russians could be within 10 miles of the center of the city after being stalled for days. Russia is amping up the attacks across Ukraine. This is video from the western city of Dnipro, where a Russian airstrike destroyed several buildings earlier this morning. Also new this morning, Ukrainian officials say Russian forces have now killed more Ukrainian civilians than soldiers. With no signs of peace in sight, the refugee crisis outside of Ukraine is growing. More than two and a half million people have left the country with more than a million Ukrainians in just Poland alone. Our Kelly Kobaya spoke with a teenager who escaped Kyiv. Uh, there was uh, like uh, not comfortable to stay there because uh, um, every night we heard uh, <laughs> it's okay. very horrible uh, sounds every night. The push to get out of the country is growing as Ukraine's president warns Russia is capable of chemical attacks. And this morning, the United States plans to take more action against Russia. President Biden is expected to end normal trade relations between the U.S. and Russia. We begin this hour in Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, where NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel reports and a warning that some viewers may find the following images distressing. Russian forces are closing in after Vladimir Putin signaled he has no intention of stopping. And Russia's foreign minister refused to acknowledge that Russia has even invaded Ukraine, saying that Russian troops are merely carrying out a limited operation to defend Russia from Ukraine. Russia opened new fronts overnight, attacking two Ukrainian cities, Lutsk in the north and Dnipro in central Ukraine for the first time while Russian troops are accelerating their advance on Kyiv. Satellite images show the 40-mile-long Russian convoy stalled for days on the outskirts of Kyiv because of fuel shortages is back on the move, dispersing and redeploying. U.S. officials warn Russia is now actively trying to encircle the capital, but Ukrainian forces are not going to make it easy. They're on the offensive, too, trying to push back Russian troops away from Kyiv in tanks and on the ground. U.S. officials predict it could take one to two weeks for Russia to surround Kyiv and another month to occupy the city. Across the country, it seems the entire population is on the move or planning for it. As of this morning, 12 humanitarian corridors have been set up to evacuate people out of cities being attacked by Russian forces, often moving those internally and precariously displaced to cities that may soon be attacked, in addition to the nearly two and a half million Ukrainians who have become Eastern Europe's latest generation of refugees, the most since World War II. One Ukrainian city remains largely cut off, Mariupol in the south, where Russia bombed a maternity hospital this week and then claimed Ukraine staged the whole thing. As residents have been forced to bury their dead in mass graves, the Red Cross warms vital medicines have run out. Russian President Vladimir Putin seems unfazed by it all, saying Russia will overcome sanctions and pointing to rising gas prices in the United States. Russia is accelerating its propaganda war and veering into dangerous territory. The Russian Defense Ministry spokesman accused the Pentagon of funding biological weapons laboratories in Ukraine in order to stealthily spread dangerous pathogens. The U.S. worries Russia may use chemical weapons and then try to blame Ukraine for it. Russia said it has also approved the use of foreign volunteers to supplement its ranks here in Ukraine and that it has already received 16,000 applicants from the Middle East ready to fight. All right, Richard, thank you. Let's get more on this with Jason Beardsley. He's the National Executive Director of the Association of the U.S. Navy. Jason, good to have you with us. So this morning we are seeing these new cities being targeted in Ukraine, including the western part of the country, which really has been considered the safer part. What's your assessment of these latest strikes? Is this a signal that Russia is saying, hey, mm. nowhere in the country is safe right now? 
picture, I, I think that would be Russia's um, play, but it's it's not really, um, uh, you can't back that up. Right now, there's still corridors uh, going from Kiev and three or four routes that uh, all the way west towards Poland. There are uh, air raids and sirens along those routes. So there is some random uh, sort of bombing and munitions raids, but a lot of their efforts right now are bogged down in multiple places down in the south towards uh, Odessa and uh, further towards the east and north towards um, uh, Kherson, where Kherson they hold, but they haven't got that completely locked down. They're also trying to make gains in the east, where nominally they've had control for eight years, the Donbass region. They're they're putting up, the Ukrainians are, a tough fight in places like Kharkiv and outside Mykolaiv. Although Mariupol's under, uh, you know, rough conditions, there's a lot of fighters down there that have long memories that have been rotating to the fronts in the Donbass. They have experience against the Russians, and you're seeing that come out with all these little strikes against the tanks. So Ukraine is going to make this a lot more difficult than just, uh, I think, what the Russians think. There's a lot of propaganda, too, so we, we've got to be careful of that. Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, in the last couple of days, we've talked a lot about those no-fly zones or the supply of weapons, even those jets that there was some back and forth on, given those to Ukraine. Now, the Pentagon has been firmly against a no-fly zone. All of NATO has been, despite Ukraine's president fiercely calling for one. But Russia is saying the West is acting dangerously, even at this point, by supplying weapons, that lethal aid to Ukraine. Do you see there being any point where NATO and therefore the U.S. does get pulled deeper into this conflict? Well, I think we can give the president some uh, credit here because from the beginning they've said they will will not get involved or not risk American lives. And we've just gotten 20 years of, of that in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I think he's got a pretty good uh, sort of consistent line there. However, uh, what Zelensky has asked for is less than the Americans or NATO defending his airspace. Give me the equipment, give me the lethal means. And from the outset of this invasion, Vladimir Putin said if, if that's the case, if NATO does involve itself by supporting with material uh, lethal munitions, uh, that that was going to cause problems. Well, we've been doing that uh, aid and in certain uh, small munitions. But as you suggested, uh, the aircraft sort of deal from Poland mm -hmm. that was a little weird, uh, that stuff got scotched. So there's a little bit of a tenuous line there. And uh, again, credit to the White House for, for holding that line. It's very difficult in, in the uh, sort of the advance of all this all the images coming out. So it's a tough line to walk, but I'm gonna just say one thing. The time to have done that was before the invasion. We had plenty of warning. The intelligence agency, to their credit, saw this invasion coming, and now we're on the heels of that. So it's a little late for us to be trying to affect the ground game other than just the support. Mm. Let's talk more about the dis diplomacy end of things, Jason. We saw yesterday the first round of talks between the Russian and Ukrainian foreign ministers. They ended without much progress. This is a tough one, but how do you see this conflict unfolding from here? Is there anything that you think could possibly bring it toward an end? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. More, <laughs> more advances by the Ukrainians and more of what we've seen, which is the Russian army has underperformed here. They are getting bogged down in every region that we see. They have minor successes, and that has fueled the resistance of the Ukrainians. They fought tremendously. The more they have these javelins and toes and anti-tank missiles, the more you're going to see this kind of bogged down. And what Vladimir Putin needs at the diplomatic table is a stack of dead bodies coming back home. And that's happening now. The casualty rates for the Russians are too high for them to sustain this for very long. And you add to that the diplomatic sanctions and the economic sanctions. This is crushing uh, Russia right now. It's humiliating. Uh, that's a dangerous place for Vladimir Putin. You're seeing the reactions of his humiliation bombing uh, maternity wards, so on and so forth, the, the war crimes. So we're not in a good place, but the Ukrainians have made this a fierce resistance, and I, I look for that to continue. That will get Putin um, at the table a little bit easier than anything else. I mean, do you think, Jason, even that, even a large number of casualties can impact Putin right now? Eventually, absolutely. They're already dealing with dissension. Uh, you hear from the uh, foreign, uh, the, their KGB, the old KGB, the FSB. Um, there's some folks under house arrest. You, we've got reports that people in the Kremlin are whispering. Uh, the point is, he's got to keep his political base uh, secure. He's got to keep the oligarchs happy. You just ran a, a report on on how that's not working out well. So people are getting squeezed around this. And if he doesn't show success as fast, uh, then then he's going to be in a tough position to hold on to power. That's why the State Department. That's why the United States is signaling.
that we may look for a chemical or a biological sort of attack, that's the kind of thing that would be a game changer if right. uh, Putin were to do something there. All right, Jason Beardsley, thank you so much. As the war in Ukraine rages on, drivers in the U.S. are seeing a sharp rise in the cost of gas. On Tuesday, the price of a regular gallon of gas broke a 14-year-old record when it hit $4.17. And this morning, it's even higher. NBC News reporter Gary Grumbach joins us now from Maryland. He's just outside Baltimore. Gary, good morning. So we're seeing these record prices there. How are people dealing with this? What are they saying when they pull into the gas station? Hey there, Savannah. Yeah, filed is under can't catch a break. Just as COVID cases are decreasing nationwide, and we're seeing all 50 states lifting their mask mandate, we, we are seeing a lot more people getting comfortable making those trips and vacations they've been talking about for more than two years. But it's going to be expensive to do that, a lot more expensive to do that. Here at a gas station in Aberdeen, Maryland, we're seeing five, uh, four fifty-three for a gallon of gas. And it's actually going to start changing the habits and the way people People drive, according to a nurse new survey out from AAA just this week, they say 60% of Americans are going to change their habits in terms of driving if gas reaches more than four dollars, which it has here and a lot of places around the country. They say 75% of Americans are going to start changing their habits if gas reaches five dollars, which experts say is very possible. In terms of how that may change, we could see a lot more carpooling and possibly even less people on the roads. Savannah, so Gary. Yeah. Politicians know high gas prices aren't a great thing to run on. Some states are starting to take matters into their own hands, including where you are in Maryland. How are they trying to ease the burden at the pump? Yeah, this is something that we are actually seeing all over the country. And, you know, you may not realize there's actually a federal gas tax on every single gallon of gas. It's 18 cents a gallon. And then there's state gas tax on top of that. So we're seeing a lot of governors taking uh, matters into their own hands and trying to say, we could try to reduce a little bit of the pain that you're feeling at the pump. In Pennsylvania, it's a 57 cent gas tax. In Iowa, it's a 30 cent gas tax. And here in Maryland, it's a 36 cent gas tax. And Governor Larry Hogan here in Maryland said he's working with the state legislature, legislature to suspend that gas tax to make it a little cheaper when folks go to the pump. Now, Gary, I mean, this has been this slow creeping increase, but it's certainly increasing. 50 cents up compared to a week ago, um, nearly a dollar from a month ago. I mean, is this just going to keep on going? Is there any sign that it's going to taper off? There's no sign that it's going to taper off, and experts say it's actually going to get a whole lot worse before it gets better. You know, Savannah, I was up in Detroit talking to GM workers a few weeks ago for a story, and they were saying this is part of the reason why people want electric cars, because they can save money at the gas tank. They don't have to worry about the $4.50 a gallon gas these days. Guys? All right, Gary Grumbach, thank you so much. We are monitoring the latest in Ukraine. We're also watching several other major stories this morning. Actor Jesse Smollett is heading to jail for falsely claiming he was the victim of a racist, homophobic attack. Coming up, the actor's outburst in the courtroom as the sentence was handed down. Plus, get ready to lose some sleep this weekend. Most of us will spring forward this Sunday for daylight saving time. The renewed push to stop changing the clocks for good. Next. Welcome back. More of our coverage out of Ukraine coming up, including the social media clips that show how the letter Z has become a pro-Russia symbol. That's ahead, but we want to get to some of the other news this morning. Midterm elections are just eight months away, and Democrats are facing a stiff test as Republicans make a push to take back both the House and the Senate. House Democrats have gathered in Philadelphia for their annual retreat to chart a path forward. Today, they'll hear from President Biden. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now from Philadelphia. She's there. Ali, good morning. So Democrats have the majority in the House and then the smallest possible advantage yeah. in the Senate. So what are they focused on? Who are they focused on? Where are they focused on as they try to maintain these majorities? <laughs> Everywhere, Savannah, <laughs> because that's really been the story of this Congress, right, is just how slim the majorities have been for Democrats in the House and in the Senate, of course. For the House Democrats here, though, their charge is now pretty set with how the maps look across the country. We know that this was a redistricting year based off of the new census numbers that came out. Now those maps are starting to come into focus, and it's really starting to look like a little bit more of a level playing field than what we thought it was going to look like. That doesn't mean, though, that Democrats aren't still in for an uphill climb. 
And they all seem to be aware of that here as we've been having multiple conversations around that. At the same time, the point of this conference really is to figure out what their messaging strategy is going forward into the midterms and how they're going to use these next eight months where they still have these majorities and what they're going to show voters they can do with them going forward, even as they message all the things that they've already done over the course of the last year. And Ali, last month, the former President Obama met with House Democrats and basically said, drum up support by focusing on wins. Well, they'll hear from President Biden today. Yeah. What kind of message do you think that's going to be? exactly that. They are going to be talking about the wins that they've had, the American Rescue Plan, COVID relief funding, all of the other things that they've done in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the idea that there will soon be shovels in the ground. I can't help but think of the fact that we are actually overlooking a bridge in the building that I'm standing in right now that would benefit from being part of that infrastructure package and shoring it up, making it safer. There are hundreds of bridges like that across the country. So you got to imagine that's something that the president is going to bring up. But we've heard a lot from lawmakers and, of course, allies in the White House who say that he needs to focus on a message of empathy, that even though the economy has come back in terms of jobless claims after the pandemic, there are still severe crises on the economic front, including women being pushed out of the workforce, but also now including the ins these inflation numbers as well as rising gas prices. All of that's going to be really important as Democrats trumpet the gains that they've won for Americans, at the same time, though, empathizing that they might not be feeling so good about things right now. Now, a lot can, of course, happen between now and midterms. They're all the way in November, of course. But what do you think is going to oh, come yeah. from this meeting, from this <laughs> annual retreat? What's sort of the go forth message from Democrats here? Yeah, the go forth message is going to be talking about the things that they've done. At the same time, right before they came here, they passed that omni spending package with a little bit of a kerfuffle over what was actually going to be in it. They got Ukraine aid into it, as well as the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act and a whole litany of other budgetary priorities. But right at the 11th hour, they had to strip out billions of dollars in COVID relief funding that the White House said that they needed and that Democrats all agree they're going to need, not just for the global stage of vaccinations, but also for future variants that could still come. That's now going to be a standalone bill, but it did sort of remind us of the fissures that still exist within this Democratic Party about how to legislate going forward. We saw it over Build Back Better and the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Now Build Back Better seems all but dead. One key progressive lawmaker here yesterday even called that bill Voldemort, the thing that we do not talk about. It is being talked about technically, although in smaller form than it initially was. But at the same time, that really does speak to the vibe that Democrats have on that signature spending package. I would also add, though, there's now sort of a wild card when you talk about the midterms. What's going on in Ukraine regarding Russia is going to be key to the next eight months. Biden's approval rating has improved slightly since the State of the Union. He is, of course, being seen as a leader in unifying on the world stage. At the same time, as much as he's being praised for that, there's now going to be a hurdle going forward as Republicans continue to hit, hit Democrats on rising gas prices and inflation. There's going to be a little bit of a juggling dance here trying to convince Americans that the prices they're seeing in places like the gas pump are worth it for what we're doing in mm -hmm. Ukraine. So that situation is going to be really key as we move forward here. And Biden, frankly, coming to Philadelphia on the heels of a new announcement that they're kicking Russia out of its favored nation trade status, that's going to mean big impacts on the economic stage as well. Ooh, absolutely, especially as we're hearing about that pinch and a lot more than just gas. Ali Vitali, thank you so much. Lots yeah. to watch for from you there later today. Turning now to the sentencing of actor Jesse Smollett, a Chicago judge handed him 150 days in jail and 30 months of probation after he was convicted of falsely reporting a hate crime to police back in 2019. Yeah, Smollett was also ordered to pay over $120,000 in restitution to the city of Chicago for the time that officers spent investigating those claims. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirst joins us from Chicago with the latest on the sentencing. Hey, Jesse, good morning. Good morning, guys. It was more than three years ago with controversy swirling around him that Jussie Smollett walked through that gate and out of the Cook County Jail. But this morning, he's waking up inside behind bars. I am not suicidal, and I am innocent. 
I could have said that I was guilty a long time ago. Even after a Cook County judge sentenced Jussie Smollett to 150 days in jail, the disgraced actor turned convicted felon sticking to his story. If I did this, then it means that I stuck my fist in the fears of black Americans in this country for over 400 years. The former Empire star's unwavering claim of innocence, ultimately his undoing. You committed hour upon hour upon hour of pure perjury. Judge James Lynn sentencing Smollett to 30 months felony probation, including that jail time, ordering he pay more than $120,000 in restitution to the city of Chicago and pay the maximum fine, $25,000. You've turned your life upside down by your misconduct and shenanigans. You've destroyed your life as you knew it. As a defiant, Smollett was taken into custody last night, his family blasting the judge's decision. He's the reason why folks aren't going to report hate crimes. They're the reason why folks aren't going to report hate crimes. The latest twist in a bizarre legal drama that goes back to 2019, when Smollett claimed he was the victim of a racist, homophobic attack. Police say it was a hoax, and late last year, a jury convicted Smollett of filing a false police report. You put the noose around your own neck. Smollett's attorney submitted over 80 letters pleading for leniency. The actor's older brother and 92-year-old grandmother speaking directly to the judge. And I ask you, the judge, not to send him to prison. If you do, send me along with him. The judge weighing the statements and Smollett's good deeds, but still sentencing him to jail time. You let that dark, narcissistic, selfish, and arrogant side come out, and you persisted with it for years on this case. The Cook County State's attorney, whose office dropped earlier charges against Smollett, calls this mob justice. But the mayor of Chicago says the city feels vindicated, Joe. Jesse, just how surprising was that outburst from Smollett? certainly caught us off guard as we watched this unfolding yesterday. Throughout much of this ordeal during the trial, including when Smollett was found guilty and when he was sentenced and told he was going to jail, the, the, the actor did not show emotion, didn't even flinch. And so to see him have that emotional outburst was very out of character for how he has held himself throughout all of this ordeal. And it certainly caught us off guard as we were watching this, but you could see that emotion coming through for him and for his family in the aftermath. Right, Jesse Kirsch reporting from Chicago. Jesse, thank you so much. Now we're gearing up for the most sleep-deprived time of the year, daylight saving time. Most of us will spring forward this Sunday, losing a precious, as we certainly feel about it, hour of sleep, but gaining more sunlight in the evening. At least we're not working that <laughs> It's true. Actually, actually, I am. But anyway, more than a billion people across the globe will have to adjust their clocks and routines by an hour, but nearly two-thirds of Americans are saying enough. They want to stop changing <laughs> their clocks for good. <laughs> With spring just days away, it's a sign of the times. Daylight saving time, that is. On Sunday morning, clocks in 48 states will spring forward as millions lose an hour of sleep and abandon standard time, which has been the standard the past four months. The polarizing adjustment is many sounding off, aptly on the app TikTok. It's only 6, 6.30. Look how dark it is outside. How do we cancel daylight savings? Among those who don't want to move clocks forward, some sleep scientists who say standard time keeps sunrise and sunset more in line with our circadian rhythm. Researchers have even found a rise in the number of heart attacks, strokes and car accidents in the days after the switch to daylight savings. It can be very disruptive and abrupt. We're creating this mismatch between what's going on in our environment and what our clocks say. Still, pro-daylight savers, who will get their way starting next week, say more sunlight in the evening encourages physical activity in the afternoon and boosts the economy because more people are shopping after work. I think it's time to change our clocks this weekend and never do it again. Senator Patty Murray is a co-sponsor of the Bipartisan Sunshine Protection Act, which would make daylight saving time permanent. We would like the light in the evening, and we would like to say to everybody, don't make me change my clock again. To dodge a drowsy start to the week, sleep specialists recommend slowly moving up your bedtime over the next couple days to avoid a shock to your system. And changing your clocks before bed on Saturday can also hack your brain for a smoother transition. Once the change is made on Sunday, expose yourself to daylight ASAP 
to quickly acclimate your body's internal clock, because like it or not, times are changing. The U.S. has actually tried permanent daylight saving time. Back in 1974, that was during the year's energy crisis. Most folks didn't like the change. They didn't enjoy waking up and going to work in the dark. So joining us now with his top tips to adjust to daylight saving is the sleep doctor, Dr. Michael J. Bruce. Good to have you with us, doctor. So daylight saving tends to throw our sleep off a bit, especially because we're losing that hour. What is your best advice to people who are worried about losing an hour this Sunday? The biggest thing that people have to be concerned about is are they already sleep deprived because losing another hour is going to have an even bigger impact. So I'm always talking to people about what can you do in the days before daylight savings. We're kind of bumping up against the end of that since it's going to be happening pretty soon. So the big thing to ask people to do is wake up at the same time every single morning, avoid alcohol this weekend because that's only going to make things worse. Um, also try to avoid any big discussions or emotional discussions over the course of the weekend, especially right after you lose that hour of sleep. We're all a little bit cranky after that. And you're also going to be hungrier that day as well. So especially if you're sleep deprived, you want to watch out for making bad food decisions. It's super easy to do, um, especially when you don't have enough sleep in your head. All right. So I have uh, an excuse for being grumpy and eating poorly on Sunday. That's good to know. <laughs> I'll do my best to try and change all of that. So this Sunday, we are going to spring forward. That means the sun will start setting later. How does that impact our natural sleep cycles? So light is the biggest factor in our circadian rhythms. Light influences them the most. So when we have more sunlight during certain periods of time, it gives us more energy and allows us to wake up earlier. When we have less sunlight, it's much more difficult. So when we don't have sunlight in the early morning hours when it's really, really dark, I gotta be honest with you, even the sleep doctor has a hard time getting out of bed sometimes because it's still dark out. Remember, darkness is what helps our melatonin continue to be produced. So when the sunlight comes, it naturally lowers our melatonin and allows us to wake up. Good to know we are not alone there. So on top of all of this, March is also the start of allergy season. Many people experience congestion, yeah. running noses and other symptoms that disrupt their sleep. Do you got any tips to help alleviate that, too? I do, as a matter of fact. So uh, other than March madness, the rest of March is a lot of allergy season for me. So I, I definitely feel you know what you're talking about here. A couple of things that people should think about. Number one, take a shower before bed or a bath before bed. If you've been outside and you've got allergens on you, it's a great way to keep allergens out of your bedroom. Another possibility, an air purifier or filter for your bedroom. Move some of those particulates out. If you can, and I know it's really tempting, Keep your windows closed. That way you don't allow some of those uh, pollen and all of that dust and things like that to come into your house. And the final tip is if you've been outside, which I hope you have, getting some sunshine and some exercise, do yourself a favor. Right when you walk in the house, take your outer layer of clothing off and put it into your laundry area. That way all of the allergens stay over there and are not throughout your house. All right. Some great advice, Dr. Bruce. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And good luck this week. And I hope, <laughs> I hope you get some rest. <laughs> I think I'm going to need it. Thanks. And wishing everybody sweet dreams. All right. Sounds oh. good. And let's get a check on your morning news now, Weather. Bill Karens is back with us. Hey, Bill. Hey, good morning, guys. You know what I do? I set my clocks ahead like Saturday morning because uh -huh. I just can't deal with that. Like, you know, I'd rather I'd rather yeah. lose it during the day. Of course, if you have, if you have any events or plans, I'm yeah. usually late or that's early really depending on idea. the time of year. But that, yeah, I don't know. that's just what I do. All right. <laughs> so let me get into this complicated weekend forecast. And unfortunately. Could be a dangerous weekend forecast, too. We're already seeing a lot of thunderstorms down along the Gulf of Mexico. The storm has a lot of juice to work with, a lot of energy. And we have a severe weather threat and flash flooding threat. And, uh, you know, flash flooding is the number one killer in our country of any weather events, more than hurricanes, more than tornadoes. So Panama City to Tallahassee to Jacksonville, Florida, that's the area of concern. You're already getting drenched. And you're going to see additional thunderstorms later today, too. 14 million people are included in the slight risk. And you notice that orange area? That's an enhanced risk risk of severe weather. So from Albany, Georgia to Tallahassee, that's the area of greatest concern down the Appalachicola. But the storms will form near New Orleans and Mobile later today and then track through the southeast. Then tomorrow morning, these storms will still be going throughout the first half of Saturday. Orlando, Daytona Beach, Palm Bay, Jacksonville, up through uh, Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, all through the Outer Banks, the Norfolk, even southern portions of Maryland and Delaware could be warm enough to get some strong storms. Mostly wind damage will be the concern tomorrow. 
the cold side of this storm, the snowy side, I mean, we're still watching about almost 70 million people that'll be impacted by this storm. So that's roughly like one in five, one in six Americans. Areas of that uh, from Kentucky to Tennessee, that's a winter storm warning that has been issued for you. And as far as the snowfall forecast, not a lot of additional snow in Texas or Oklahoma, but from Little Rock to Memphis, we'll call you with an inch. Same for Nashville, it should get an inch or two. Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, same for you. But the higher snow totals are definitely from West Virginia all the way up there through um, Pennsylvania, upstate New York, and the higher elevations of New England. So here's the forecast. Cold air invading from the north, that's going to be responsible for our snowstorm. The east coast looks fine today, but then Saturday's the ugly day. Rain to snow, even for the D.C., Philly, New York, and Boston areas. It won't be a huge snowstorm for those areas, but enough to make it very slippery come Saturday evening. And then Sunday, as we're all trying to figure out you know, why the sun is... Uh, going to set so late in the day, uh, bitter wind chills in the Northeast. So I don't know what side of that argument you guys are on. Do you like the later sunset or do you like, you know, the, the sunrise I, earlier? I'm still pro daylight saving. I like the later sunset because yeah, you have plans, you're social, you're doing dinner. Also, my circadian rhythm was destroyed yeah. years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so that doesn't really matter. <laughs> How about you, Bill? Yeah, uh, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Uh, I prefer the earlier sunrise, okay. um, but mm. that's just me. You're a standard yeah. timer. You get it four months a year. So Standard timer. <laughs> All right. That's it. Thanks, Bill. Thank November Bill. to March. Yeah. There you go. Four months. <laughs> woo -hoo. All right. All right. Our coverage from Ukraine continues in just a few minutes. Yeah, this morning we're digging into a question a lot of you have actually been asking. What's with the letter Z? It's been seen on Russian tanks during the invasion. Coming up, what our social news gathering team is learning about this after the break. Welcome back. So we've been, of course, using the images coming out of Ukraine to understand the true scale of devastation here. And actually, a lot of what we're consuming is video from social media. Now, a lot of people have been talking about something they've seen in quite a few places. A lot of you have sent us questions about it. Watch this video. Check this out. You see this letter Z here right under this man's arm? Here it is right here, Z. That's been seen on a lot of Russian military vehicles. There it is on the fronts of these ones as well. Well, get this. That's a letter that actually doesn't exist in Russia's alphabet. Now, though, it's a pro-war symbol supporting President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Now, we don't know when this video Again, there's that Z that you're looking at right here was shot, but it was posted, we know, on March 1st. So now let's look at some videos verified, that's the key word here, by our NBC News social gathering team. What we're going to see here is the same symbol. It's on the backs of some of these tanks. You probably just saw it just a moment ago. These here are Russian vehicles on the street in Kharkiv, Ukraine. Coming up, you'll probably see it in just a moment here. These videos here show that same Z again. So now what we want to know is exactly how we know what this is. So you can see the Z here. Let me pull up this screenshot for you right here on the side of these vehicles. This here, these are men in Ukrainian military uniforms. So important, an important question to ask yourself as you're seeing these videos, how do we know then that this is in fact a Russian military vehicle in Ukraine? That's where our social news gathering team comes in. Sara Mahidli on that team. She started by verifying where this happened. Let me show you what she's looking at. This here, this is just Google Maps, same tool you have. She's using coordinates to see the street view. This is what I want you to pay attention to right here is this. See this red roofing, orangish roofing there? Well, then when we go back to our video right here, you can see right there showing the same storefront, that same red orange roof you see in the video. And we do already know from Ukrainian officials that the Russian military entered Kharkiv. So that's how we were sort of able to piece that together. Plus, we've seen, here we go, this Z again, other videos in other Ukrainian cities with these Russian military vehicles painted with that letter Z all over them. This one was verified by our teammate Bianca Britton in Melitopol. It's showing Ukrainian people pushing against these vehicles. You'll even see them laying down in front of it. It's actually not clear what the Z stands for, how it came to mean what it does. We just know now that it's this pro-Russia symbol, not just seen on military vehicles. We're also seeing it painted in St. Petersburg, Russia, over in Russia, not just Ukraine, and used in this Russian propaganda video. You see this on all these T-shirts, of course, right here. This was broken down on Twitter by a researcher at the Wilson Center. That's a nonpartisan think tank in Washington, D.C. Now, as our social news gathering team verifies more videos, we're going to be on the lookout for this. And we really just want to break down behind the scenes how this works when you're reading and seeing that that video has been verified by our organization. 
that's how we're doing it. It takes a lot of really talented people who are making sure that we're getting you the right information. Yeah, it certainly does. Interesting to see how that works behind the scenes. Thank you, Savannah. Now, the exodus of refugees from Ukraine is straining even the most generous efforts to support and comfort them once they escape. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea reports from the Polish border where she heard about their struggles and their hopes for the future. A refugee families arriving at this reception center, sort of a waypoint uh, before they move on to bigger cities and in sometimes other countries as Poland and the other countries bordering Ukraine struggle to cope with the overwhelming need. Relief as child cancer patients reach the border with Poland, evacuated from the war ravaged city of Kharkiv. Joining the exodus of more than two million, mostly women and children, fleeing Ukraine. 16 year old Diana Prutska escaped Kyiv. What was it like there? Uh, there was uh, like uh, not comfortable to stay there because uh, um, every night we heard. Uh... <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, sounds every night. Vice President Kamala Harris met with Ukrainian teens on the border Thursday. The Senate approving a spending bill overnight that includes 1.4 billion to support refugees. More than 100,000 arrive every day in Poland to open doors and hearts. Donations are flooding in, volunteers offering help. But countries bordering Ukraine are struggling to find enough beds as the numbers rise. Like, what was this before? Just a meeting room? <laughs> that was the office. CEO Bartosz Skvarczyk has turned his gaming company offices into a shelter for up to 50 refugees with a kitchen and a playroom for kids. So they are in terrible situation and, and you know, a little smile from them is like a sunrise. Down the hall, 72-year-old grandmother Ala Devulak told me she didn't want to leave Ukraine but feared she'd be killed. Where are you going next? Chicago. To Chicago. Chicago. You have family in Chicago? Yes, she tells me. Her grandchildren in the U.S. terrified for her. Uh, grandmother, we, we have to save because she, she can't fight. She, she's too old. Like so many Ukrainian refugees, now in limbo, far from home. Ala's grandkids are now trying to get her a tourist visa so she can at least be with family in the short term in the United States. Long term, they say she wants to go back to Ukraine. And Poland's president now pressing the United States for more than just financial aid. He wants the U.S. to expedite visas for Ukrainians who have family in the U.S. Kelly, thank you. Let's stay on the refugee crisis and bring in Zach Brooks Miller. He's the senior director of international programs at Team Rubicon. Zach, good morning. Thank you for joining us. First of all, just, just tell us more about Team Rubicon and what it is your organization is doing right now on the ground in Poland. Yeah, absolutely. Team Rubicon is a humanitarian aid non-governmental organization which you know helps communities around the world prepare, recover, and respond to disasters. Uh, we've had teams in Poland uh, for about 12 days now. Uh, we've also extended uh, needs assessment and coordination teams into Moldova, Hungary, and Slovakia. Currently working with the United Nations, uh, the WHO, UN OCHA, and USAID on where our services best fit uh, in Poland and possibly into Ukraine. The numbers that we're seeing really tell the story of this crisis. The UN now says 549 Ukrainian civilians have been killed. That includes 41 children. From your perspective, do you see more Ukrainians fleeing? How much worse is this crisis getting right now? Yeah, I mean, the, the crisis continues to escalate. Uh, you heard the figures earlier. 2.5 million have already fled the country. You've already seen, or, and you're also seeing 2 million internally displaced people. Uh, within the country as they flee the conflict in the east. Those individuals are starting to uh, mass in the western part of the country, which is creating strain on the existing uh, medical, food, water uh, infrastructure in that part of the country. So we're currently working with uh, the Ministry of Health in Ukraine and other partners uh, to provide medical care in the western part of Ukraine. How can people who are watching this unfold on their TVs, on their screens, and just wondering, what they can do to help. What is it that people in Ukraine and Poland need most right now? 
Right now, the best way to support is with donate is donating money. Um, there's you know, numerous organizations working in Ukraine uh, and along the border. Uh, if you want to donate to Team Rubicon, it's www.teamrubiconusa.org. Click donate. Um, but yeah, cash is is pretty important right now. Tell us about some of these these volunteers who are leaving whatever it is they're doing to go and help out. I mean, talk about extraordinary. Yeah, we, you know, we have over 150,000 volunteers uh, within the organization. They come from all walks of life. There are first responders, you know, doctors, nurses, uh, paramedics, firefighters, military veterans uh, who put down their put down their daily, daily lives and and step up to the call to action to support those who need it most. I know we're grateful for that, and I know people in Europe are especially grateful for that. Zach, thanks so much for joining us again. And once again, to donate Thank to you. help Ukrainian refugees, you can do so at teamrubiconusa.org. Mm -hmm. Amazing to hear about. Now, there's a big issue impacting millions of teens in the U.S. Vaping. But this morning, we're focusing on why teens are turning to vapes. Coming up, the impact mental health is having on addiction and what experts are doing to try and control the use of vaping in teens. Plus, it's been two years since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. With cases now reaching new lows, what comes next? We bring that question to one of our doctors after the break. We want to focus now on a big issue for teens and young adults, vaping and how it ties in with the mental health crisis. More than a quarter of high school seniors mm. used e-cigarettes in 2021. That's according to the latest Monitoring the Future survey. Yeah, many are vaping as a way to control things like stress and anxiety, even though the CDC says it's unsafe for young people to use e-cigarettes. Well, some experts are saying vaping makes mental health problems much worse. I spoke to some teens about their experiences. All right, so it is day number two. Um, I just woke up and the first thing I did was go to grab my vape, which usually sits right about there. But it wasn't there this morning. That's Parker. He's a college student, a gamer, and has been nicotine free for about five months. Parker started vaping while he was a freshman in high school because a bunch of his friends were doing it. Back then, he would turn to vaping to relieve his anxiety, but now believes the habit was making his anxiety worse. What made you start to realize that connection? There were times where I would go out and I would like need to have my vape with me like at all times. And whenever I would get anxious, I would hit it. And when I didn't have it, it would exemplify the effects of my anxiety and my stress. When you look back now, at how you were feeling when you were vaping. How strong is the connection between your vape pen and anxiety? Extremely strong. I, I think that most times where I had like mass amounts of anxiety or panic, it was always correlated to the fact that I had it with me or I was using it. The Truth Initiative, a nonprofit working to combat tobacco use and nicotine addiction, is helping Parker share his story as part of their ongoing effort to help young people quit. A survey by the organization found that 81% of people start vaping to decrease anxiety, depression, or stress. But some experts say it does the opposite. People who have a tendency to have mental health problems, increased stress, anxiety, depression, are more likely to vape. But vaping also worsens mental health symptoms, particularly of stress, anxiety, and sometimes depression as well. And here's the science behind it. Initially, you get this boost of dopamine into your brain. That really tricks people into thinking, oh yeah, this is something that's good, I, it definitely feels good. But over time, what happens is your body creates more nicotine receptors in the pleasure center of the brain, making it harder for you to reduce stress through any other means than to take another hit of this product. That's why Dr. Winnikoff says vaping is so dangerous but there is a silver lining. If you are able to quit, it actually creates a really positive mental health picture, uh, which is why cessation programs are just so important because there's no, there's nothing about this that traps you forever. Alyssa Badalato quit vaping about a year ago and hasn't looked back. My anxiety is better. I'm able to have clearer thoughts. Um, just overall, I feel more myself and I feel better. What would you say to someone who, who's there right now who thinks that vaping is actually helping their mental health? I would look them straight in the face and say, that's what I thought too, but it's not the truth. 
So if you have that even little bit of yourself that wants to quit, wants to get over it, you're already there. That's all that it takes. And you just have to put some drive behind that. And you'll see the positive outcomes that will come into your life. Let's bring in Robin Koval. She's the CEO and president of Truth Initiative. That's America's largest nonprofit public health organization dedicating to making tobacco use and nicotine addiction a thing of the past. Robin, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So Alyssa and Parker, who we just heard from in that piece, they both used the Truth Campaign's anonymous texting program to help them quit, which I think is so important, that word anonymous, of course. So the really important question for somebody who's watching who wants to quit or wants to help a young person in their life quit, what do you tell them? Well, thanks for having me here. Um, first of all, I would tell them uh, <clears throat> to do what these other young people did and to text uh, to Ditch Vape at 88709, which is our This Is Quitting program. It is a text message program. You do it on your phone. It's anonymous. Your parents don't have to know. Your teachers don't have to know. Your friends don't even have to know. Um, over 425,000 young people have enrolled in this program. Mm, wow. We know that it works. Um, and, you know, it's because it's developed obviously by experts who know uh, um, how to help people quit, uh, but also because we developed it with other young people. So it feels peer to peer, um, honest, friendly. Um, and you heard from those young people, it really, really works. Mm. Absolutely. Now, on Monday, Truth Initiative is launching a new campaign called Breath of Stress Air. First, we want to take a look at this new ad, this new campaign, and this is actually the first time it's airing anywhere. Here we go. Yeah. Breathe in and wonder, is this helping? Breathe. Now you should feel much worse. Vaping nicotine can actually increase feelings of stress and anxiety. Let's call a vape what it is. It's a breath of stress air. See for yourself. Breathofstressair.com. Robin, tell us about the goal of this campaign and its importance in reaching young people. I know Parker found the Truth Initiative in that piece by seeing an ad like this. Walk us through what your goal is here. Well, our goal here is we really want to do two things, right? We want to denormalize vaping, um, mm -hmm. and we also want to normalize quitting. And what this uh, effort, Breath of Stress Air, is trying to do, and it's really building on um, what we call it's messing with our head platform, where we introduce the idea that, you know, a vape really should be called a um, depression stick because that's mm, what wow. these products do, right? They amplify feelings of depression and anxiety. Every time you take a hit on a vape, you are literally taking a breath of stress air. And, you know, that's an important fact because most young people think, uh, because the tobacco and the vaping industry has worked very hard to communicate this, that, you know, vaping uh, reduces feelings of anxiety, that, may, that takes your stress away. And that's exactly the opposite. Instead of being a stress reliever, it's really a stress amplifier. Robin Koval, thank you so much. Such important info there, especially as the FDA hasn't done all that much about this. Thank you for joining us and congrats on the new campaign. Thanks so much. It has been two years, exactly two years, mm -hmm. since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Quickly, the world came to a halt as leaders raced to control the spread of the virus. Now, over six million people across the world lost their lives, and another 453 million have been infected with the virus, many of them still suffering symptoms these years later. Advocates in the U.S. are now calling for a day of memorial to remember those who died because of COVID and the families, of course, who will never be the same. The World Health Organization had this to say about our continued fight against the virus. The virus continues to evolve and we continue to face major obstacles in distributing vaccines, tests and treatments everywhere they are needed. The pandemic is far from over and it will not be over anywhere until it's over everywhere. There is hope on the horizon. Cases and hospitalization rates are dropping in the U.S., prompting many states to reevaluate their COVID protocols, dropping mandates that have been in place since 2020. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now to look back on these last two years. Good to have you with us. I mean, remind us how far we've come in the last two years, yeah. how much we've learned, 
and also how much we've lost. You know, I, I think you can categorize it two ways, you guys. I think there are things that we did really well, and there are things that we clearly messed up on. You know, pandemic preparedness is is composed of a lot of different components, epidemiology, therapeutics, prevention. Um, you know, I think we did a great job mobilizing the scientific world community, yeah. right? The collaboration between government and industry, Operation Warp Speed, those were all great things. Things where we clearly had deficiencies, it exposed the deficiencies in mm -hmm. our public health infrastructure. Messaging was an issue. Equity has been a huge issue. And I think, which is what, something that is really, really important right now, is funding, right? We had a $22 billion ask from Congress. We had $15 billion stripped from the next package. You know what they're anticipating? In one month's time, we're going to have inadequate money for testing by May for monoclonal antibodies. Further than that, for Paxlovid, the antivirals, the funding of this is so important. As Dr. Tedro said, it's not over anywhere until it's over everywhere. Only 14% yeah. of folks in low-income countries have had one dose wow. of vaccine. So while we've made great strides here in the U.S., guys, globally, we are. this is not behind us yet. Oof, it's not. Absolutely. Let's talk about turning points. Of course, the vaccine. What stands out to you when you look back at this two years? Oh, my goodness. I, I would say the vaccine, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and all the credit goes to, to the former administration for Operation Warp Speed, and the credit goes to this administration for um, for, for being able to deploy vaccination across the country. But as, as I mentioned, and as we all know, there have been incredible hindrances to getting the, mm -hmm. the, the well, we have the majority of our population vaccinated, but still populations, a significant percentage who have not been vaccinated. Um, you know, it, I, like I, I always say, we just can't look at this pandemic from, um, you know, from just the, the United States eye, from the Western Hemisphere's eye. This is a global pandemic. And so, uh, you know, we really have to keep our eyes wide open moving forward, even though it looks good here. It looks great in New York City. We're we're sitting together. We're not wearing masks. And I hope that lasts. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the mm -hmm. virus is tricky. It's tricked us before. And Omicron taught us how quickly things can change. I exactly. mean, absolutely rapidly. Literally from and, a week to the next. And we yes. weren't ready. Yeah. So with that, I ask you, what do you think is next for COVID? And are we prepared if something like this happens again? Did we learn a lesson in these last two well, years? Well, that's the thing, which is why the funding issue is so frustrating, because right. you, you, you have to be looking at forward um, with, with your eyes wide open. And, and it's shocking to me that anyone in this country would assume that we have it all behind us, given what's happened before. Um, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged that the vaccinations we have are still holding up and are still effective against the new variants that come. But, you know, again, like we've said before, it's a sneaky virus. I hope it doesn't throw us a lot of new curveballs. I think the United States and certain areas, of course, of Europe are headed in absolutely the right direction. Um, but we just can't strip everything away, yeah. including money, all at one time. I think we're really going to we're, we're going to surprise ourselves in, in an unfortunate way in a couple of weeks to months, if that's the case. Mm. Let's hope that that is not the case. Exactly. And thank you so much. I mean, what, an, what a milestone for us all to look Absolutely. back on two years later. I think a lot of us are reflecting on where we were two years where ago we today. Were, and, what you and, saw, and, what you remember being the changing point for you, the NBA. <laughs> yes, I remember watching See, that game and going, uh-oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. yeah, a lot of people probably do. Yeah. All right, Dr. Azar, thank you so much. Yeah. Great to have you with us. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.